He was uh, the finest player that I've ever seen in a heart jersey. It's, it's a, a thing that he'll always be remembered, you know. Aye. Holyrood may have been the home of kings, but the one most revered in Edinburgh had his seat a couple of miles to the west at Tynecastle. Willie Bald reigned over hearts from 1946 to 1962. None of their players, before or since, has left such a cherished memory. He was an extraordinary footballer, touched apparently by a sense of humility which further endeared him to his thousands of admirers. It is fitting testament to both the player and the personality that long after his death in 1977, his name is preserved and celebrated annually by the Willie Bald Memorial Club. William Russell Logan Bald was born in New Craig Hall in 1928 and, once signed by Hearts, served spells with Newton Grange Star and Edinburgh City before beginning to inspire his own legend and that of the terrible trio. Con, Bald and Wardhoe played the first time together in October 1948 against East Fife at Tynecastle, with Willie scoring a hat-trick. Beginner's luck? Hardly. Willie followed up his debut by scoring another three goals against Queen of the South and Hearts' next match. The man who would be King of Hearts had made a regal start to a career which finally yielded 356 goals and 510 appearances. A record surpassed only by that of one of his arch accomplices, Jimmy Wardhoe. He scored 375 goals and 517 matches. The laughable thing was that Willie Bald was said to be lazy, a criticism to which his manager, the late Tommy Walker, gave, well, just a little credence by saying once, I know he could occasionally give the impression of being, uh, how can we put it, unindustrious. He was lazy, but if somebody always had been on his toes, as I was telling you, I mean, he was a lazy, even at training, Willie would go at the back of the field, he was quite happy to jog along round the park, and maybe the, the trainer never bored him, you know, he just let him be on that park on a Saturday. He did his job, you know. But, uh, oh no, I mean, uh, with a good trainer, I think uh, uh, part of our, our success was our trainer, John Harvey, you know, when, when he trained the managerial side, I think that was his downfall, pressure, you know. I think he was a brilliant uh, coach and he had you at a peak where you know you didn't you didn't go and then you drop. You went there and you held your, you know, what they call the, this peak. But I think he was uh, Mr. He was a hearts, what they call the, the, the main man. He was in the army and things like that and I think he'd everything out to a tee, you know, where he'd, the fitness angle played a big part in our team. There weren't any teams fitter than us, as, you know, I'm talking about, and, uh, and we used, we used uh, you know, the skills and, and the ability of the forwards and and it played a big part in heart success. If you've not got an injured room, you've got nothing. You know, I mean, I mean, it's all right saying you've got four uh, men now, but that doesn't mean to say, you know, it doesn't matter why you've got four, you've got to be able to get that ball, you know, to people that's got to do the necessary. No, I, I could never, never say that Willie was lazy. He was deceptive, very deceptive. And so far, he, he could take a centre half out of position very easily by going to the wings, either wing. Now, he just can't do that and be lazy. So he could drag them away for the likes of Con and Morta to do that. No, I would say he was, he was deceiving. Just to, the way he moved, but I would never say he was lazy. He was too clever to be lazy. He was too clever. He could take up position and Wharton Con could, they knew he was there and they could turn it away and they knew Willie would be right on there if they crossed the ball and or anything like that, you know. What was his biggest strength, do you think? Head in the ball. 
dependable. When the when a, a ball come across at any time in the box at Tencastle, they left it over He was there and he could place it. It just didn't go in and blindly head a ball. He placed it when he was heading it, you know. He could place it at any angle, depending on where he was standing and received the cross. I would say that was his greatest asset. And he was never scared of going in there. Didn't matter who the centre half was, he was still going in against them, you know. He was called the, the King of Hearts. Why him? Why not Corn? Why not Warthog? Why not Cummings? Why Willie? Because Willie always seemed to be the guy that was there to finish everything they had done, you know. Or, having said that, he was the brains as well. I mean, they, they were brilliant inside forward, the two of them. And a lot of people thought, they were the brainy guys, but it was actually Willie, because he could take the positions up. And I think people recognised this. Willie will be there to finish it off. Though having said that, Jimmy Wardhaw scored more goals than Willie Ball in their days at Tyne Castle, funnily enough. But uh, he was uh, what you call a wee poacher. He fed off of Willie, because Willie would head them down to if he couldn't head them into the net, he said he would head it down to Jimmy, and Jimmy would have it in. Either that or on the deck, do the same thing, put it out to Alpha Con, and when Alpha Con hit a ball, it was going in. In fact, it used to be uh, debated in Edinburgh who could strike a ball harder, was the Alpha Con or uh, Eddie Turnbull of Hibs. Actually, I think that's how the people recognise Willie, you know, because he could do things that some other players just couldn't think. And therefore, he wasn't lazy, he was deceptive. That's the word I would describe Willie Ball as being deceptive. But opposing defenders could not afford to be lazy as he drifted deceptively right and left with the ball at his feet or leapt majestically for it in the air. His gifts overshadowed his weaknesses to the degree that Tommy Walker described him as a great player, wonderful really. And Willie himself challenged any question of his application by saying that with a family to support, he could not afford to be anything less than honest and wholehearted in his approach to football. Wooly wasn't the best of trainers, you know. I mean, I trained with Wooly, and Wooly always was at the back of the field, you know. But I mean, that was his nature. I mean, Wooly was a, he was a very shy person, you know. I mean, you get to know him, you know. And I used to pick him up, and everything about him was, everything was his wife. Had a cup of tea ready for him. He would come down the stair and things like that, you know. And he was mollycoddled, you know. And and but he's, he was uh, at ten when he went on to football park. He changed if somebody actually had, you know. I'm talking about give him a bit, of, you know, a bit stick, you know, like Willie Telford or Willie Woodburn. That's when Willie Ball rose his game, you know. But he wasn't the best of trainers, you know. He was away at the back of the field and the rest of the lads were up front. That was just, it just you couldn't change him. Very nice, and you never heard them arguing or nothing, you know. But if somebody actually had a dig at him, you know, we, we always hoped that when you were playing against the centre half, he would, you know. But he was a great, a great lad. He had brilliant balance. He was good in the ball. He could hit a ball. He could bring a ball down. He could head the ball to people. He had that many strengths in his, you know, his football ability. But to oh no, I mean, he was. Uh, Nobody could say anything bad about him, you know, but he was very shy. That was the big thing. Of Midlothian in dark shirts kick off at Tynecastle against Aberdeen. Both teams have suffered recently with injuries, but are at full strength for this needle match. In the first few minutes, Leggett throws in for the Dons. Teammate Buckley outpaces Glidden, and hearts are in danger. A wonderful save by Duff, but he can't stop the corner. Leggett takes it, and hearts are in trouble. McAllister heads, and Duff's beaten. Aberdeen draw first blood. Duff faces Buckley but keeps the net clear. 
Duff's playing a great game despite that early setback. Away go Haas to try and crack the Don's determined defence. Young tackles and robs Urquhart of a chance. Half-time comes with honours, if not the score, just about even. Aberdeen soon have a corner after the resumption, but the Hearts defence gets it away and out to Soonest, number seven on the wing. Smith intercepts, but it's a corner to Hearts. Appropriately, it's Soonest who takes it. Goldie Martin touches it, but Alistair clears to safety. But it's not safe for long. Soonest lobs it to Bald, who cracks it into the net to level the score. set out for another and again it's Soonest who takes up the running. In the second half it's Hearts nearly all the way but try as they will they don't seem able to get it past Aberdeen's defenders. Soonest takes a corner but there's still nothing doing. And one all is the final score so Hearts and Aberdeen will meet again. Uh, I played for various uh, school teams you know, and he progressed to, uh, 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 to Musselborough Union. He went to the Musselborough Union. Then from there he went to a team called the uh, Musselborough Athletic. And uh, it was from there that Hart signed Wally Bond. He was on the verge of actually going to Sunderland. But uh, Dave McLean, who was the manager previous to uh, Tommy Walker stepped in there very quickly and signed him for Hearts, who in turn uh, farmed Willie out to uh, Newton Green Star. And uh, he was toughened up there a bit in the juniors. And uh, then he came back to Tyne Castle, but he wasn't long in the reserves, and they farmed him right away to Edinburgh City, who were a club that played on the, the then C Division and the Scottish football. And uh, Wally became a great star then, and uh, oh, the Edinburgh City fans, who were diehards in their own right for Edinburgh City, uh, idolised Wally, even though he was just a young lad at that time. In fact, they'd be, Wally Ball would be about ages from myself, uh, 1948. He would be a year younger than me, Wally, 1948. I was born in 1925, so only would be about 18 at that time. And uh, I did brilliant with Edinburgh City, so they, they brought him, when he was knocking on the goals, they brought him right back to Town Castle. And they never looked back after that. They just progressed from there. So why was it that he gained the derisory three caps for Scotland against England, Switzerland and Portugal within the space of a couple of months in 1950? scoring a goal in each of the last two. Part of the reason could be identified on the opposite side of Edinburgh, where Willie's arch-rival was Hibbs Laurie Riley, a solid favourite with the selectors, probably because he was an altogether different type of player whose game was built on zest rather than style. I think he was a, well, he was a sort of loner fella, you know, I mean, I felt he, he was always happy with hearts, but when he went away, you know, just... I don't think he gave him, he gave Scotland his best. He was still a good player, but I think he was more or less, you know, just felt like he, he, he wasn't amongst, you know, you get players like that. I mean, Gordon Smith couldn't play well with Scotland at times either. I mean, you get players, you know, and he did great ability. You get players that, you know, that's what happens. But uh, he didn't play well, but he wasn't, I'm, I'm saying, I think he missed, uh, I think if they had played Jimmy Ward or with him and that, you know, of course, this is what happens, you see. You get a stranger, and you play with somebody, you know, and 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 this is what happens. But uh, I think that uh, you know that they, they were that good to freedom, and plus, you see, they were getting plenty of the ball, and and the game was flowing, and all of what it's doing nowadays. I mean, you have maybe thirty nine uh, stoppages in a game. It's and that's what's happening. But you know, the game gets stopped, the referee, everything's all. Aye. They had not won a major trophy for 48 years when they faced Motherwell in the League Cup final of 1954 at Hamden. But Hearts won 4-2 with Willie scoring a hat-trick and capturing most of the acclaim when the team returned to Edinburgh.
Hearts in dark jerseys kicked off at Hampden Park and Johnston of Motherwell was soon in action. It was the Tyne Castle side's first semi-final since the war. Motherwell, who knocked out the Rangers, gave as good as they got. In a Motherwell attack, goalie Brown came out to save. A tussle in the goal mouth followed. Then a hefty charge bowled Brown over and the ref had to cool down some hot feelings. Hearts opened the scoring. Rutherford shot, but the ball was deflected for a corner. From the corner kick, the ball rolled towards the goal and Conn put it in to give Hearts a lead of 1-0 at half-time. Resuming, Motherwell went all out to pull the game out of the fire. And there was some fine football. Here's a grand Motherwell attack which only just failed when Kelly's shot skinned the goal. Here's the shot. With Hearts trying to increase their slim lead, it was a needle game. Here's Rutherford again. Johnston missed, but it was safely cleared. Then came Motherwell's equaliser. A little lucky maybe, but well deserved. Inside left, Watson fired in a shot which hit the post. Mackenzie tried to save, but the ball seemed to bounce off him into the net. There were no more goals, and a draw was a good result in the afternoon's grand play. Willie Bald was pushing towards the prime of his career when, in 1956, Hearts won the Scottish Cup by beating Celtic 3-1 at Hampden, with two goals by Ian Crawford and another by Alfie Conn. Willie's most valued work of the competition had been in an earlier round against the old firm's better half, Rangers, at Tynecastle. Hearts won 4-0 that day, with the King claiming two of the goals. Riley claimed many of the caps which might have been balls, although the Tynecastle centre forward lost more still because of a catalogue of injuries, which, as the Hearts programme once testified, ranged from rib to toe. That famous toe injury, popularly referred to as the Big T disaster, struck in the mid-1950s, by which time Willie had made possibly his most spectacular contribution to Hearts history. But he wished he'd done more to help them win the championship for the first time in the century, in 1957-58, when they lost only one match to Clyde and scored a record number of goals, 132. The, the cup final was selfish. Well, it was a, it, we were underdogs to start with, you know, and, and but we, we felt we were never underdogs because I felt that in fitness alone, you know, it, we went there that day, and the support that was there, I'm told when you're told 132,800, and there were a lot of neutrals, you know. And we felt that, you know, it was our, it was our attitude to the game, the mental attitude that got us, and we were the fittest team. And it was a good, it was a brilliant game, you know. It was end to end, but we felt that when the goals come, but uh, it's... It was, a, it was a great occasion, you know, and in and, and 54 when we beat Mull and all, you know, in the League Cup before that. And uh, I think the longer, the more victories you get, you get a bit of confidence in yourself, you know, that nobody better than us, you know, it's, it's a mental thing. And when I say you don't do your talking to the press and that, you do it on the part. You know, you hear the boys say, you know, what are we going to do with this team, and then it turns the other way. I think uh, in our day we're more quieter. And we had confidence in ourselves to believe in our, the mental attitude going to part. And that's a big thing, you know. Celtic in hoop shirts kick off against Hearts in the Scottish FA Cup final at Hampden Park. The Celtic have the ball. John Cumming intercepts, but Celtic retrieve it. The Celtic attacking before the Hearts goal mouth. The defenders get the ball away, but Celtic are soon pressing again. Hearts right half Dave Mackay fails to stop them. So does right back Kirk. But Kirk chases after the ball and manages to deflect it over the line. Now a Hearts attack. Alfie Conn loses it. Jimmy Wartor gets it away. He's impeded, but Mackay comes to the rescue. 
Murphy Con races to beat the Celtic defence. He gets through, passes to Ian Crawford, and Crawford slams it home. <laughs> Second half, with Hearts battling to increase their 1-0 lead. A quick tussle, and Celtic managed to clear for the moment. But centre-forward Willie Ball soon brings it back down the left wing. Ball centres. Young and Fallon jump, but Crawford's there, and it's another goal for Hearts. <laughs> Celtic have got their work cut out if they're going to catch up now. They sweep down on the Hearts goal. Goalie Duff drops it, and Mike Horney scores. <laughs> Hearts 2, Celtic 1, and now Hearts are taking a corner kick. Goalie Dick Beatty jumps, it goes to Ian Crawford, who shoots wide. Goal kick to Celtic. The ball goes loose and Hearts kick up field. Willie Ball beats Bobby Evans, Alfie Conn shoots, and Beatty can't save it. Hearts three, Celtic one. And that's the final score. It's 49 years since Hearts were in the final. On that occasion, it was Celtic who beat them, 3-0. Hearts have had to wait for half a century to get their revenge. Now, at last, it's theirs. And so is that precious cup. What's your fondest memory of, of Willie, you know, in a match? Well, I, th I think when we, we won the, the Scottish against Celtic in 1956, you know, I mean, him and... Uh, with a good forward line, it wasn't just the, what they call the terrible trio. With wingers, they could get the byline, you know. And, and I think they gelled well, you know, this is the thing. They had a great understanding, you know. And I think... It, I feel like the game was open in these days, you know. Everybody had the talk about the uh, overlapping fullbacks. We had a, a big outside, well, he was an outside left, Tom McKenzie was a left back. When we played Hibs, Tom McKenzie actually played Gordon Smith as if Gordon Smith was a fullback. He went by him and get the bylines. But everybody covered for one another. You know, this is the difference. Somebody went, you slit into, you know. I think we, we, we played in sort of triangles, you know. And it was, I think it was a lot easier to play, you know, and I felt like that's why I think the game's... I'll go and watch it, you know, as you say, but Willie's strength was in the air, but he was still strong, you know, his, his physical side of the, the game was, they could do anything with him, and the more they kicked him, I think Willie gets stronger and stronger, plus, you know, it was something to give him a, what they call a boost. But he's, he's really a marvellous, you know, player, but he had a great gel with Wardo and Con and, and the teams, you know, when the teams played with wingers, and I think it was... You know, I think the game was open all the time, you know, and, and there were none of this. The game never got stopped. It was always flowing, flowing, flowing. No stoppages, really. Well, I can remember the 1956 Scottish Cup final at Hamden when uh, John got injured. And uh, everybody thought, though, he shouldn't be on the park at all because uh, the blood was streaming from his forehead. But uh, this day and age he would have been off the park, but uh, he decided he would play on and that was John Cummins. You would have needed to uh, break his legs before he'd have given, given up playing. But uh, he went on to the, he was left half that day, but he went to the outside left position to finish the game as it were, holding the sponge to, uh, to his head, but that wasn't a John. Things weren't going that way in that left wing, so he reverted back to left half, and uh, that never worried him. No. What about the time you played with your head gashed open? Huck, it's one of these things I've been used to getting knocks and things like that, and it was a, I was actually going for the ball, and Wally Ferny, I was getting up, and I was coming down, and Wally was getting up, and they got me under the eye. I got, you know, four stitches under Ken. It was just the timing, but it didn't. In these days, you, you went off, and the sticks me, and I come back on again. Ken, but it, it didn't worry me, blood was nothing, you know, that's how I feel about it. I've always had knocks and things like that, and I've played with knocks, and end of the day, you know, the trainer come to me on Friday and say, how do you feel? I'm all right. And they picked me, because they believed in my, you know, I just, I mean, that's what you did on a Friday, if you'd, maybe you had a couple of injuries, and you're getting treatment and that, and then you'd say on a Friday, how are you? So I'm fine. And that was good enough, you know, for... You, you used to collect Willie on the way down. That's right. Uh, I used to go in the Lang Huang. Uh -huh. uh, I used to go in 
an hour before my time. I used to leave Kluk about seven o'clock when I got a car. And I used to be there at eight. Well, we didn't come in at ten o'clock, but I used to go into the gymnasium in the morning and do work up. But Willie, because Willie was, Margaret, he was just going up out of bed when I was getting to Edinburgh. And he'd come down the, you know, this is true, he'd come down and he'd come down the stair half asleep, you know, and Margaret would give him his tea. And that was his way there, you know. You wouldn't ruffle him. And I used to get in and I used to say, you need to be early in the morning because I went up the stairs to do my training because I used to go into the gym and do, you know, a warm up. But you wouldn't, you wouldn't ruffle him, you know, he just starts his way, but, but oh, he, 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 was a, he was a personality in his own way, you know, and he was a great player. He was the victim of injuries once more that season and the fine play of younger men like Alec Young and Jimmy Murray further ensured that he was used quite sparingly by manager Walker. The King was not for abdicating though, and his crown was still firmly in place the following season when he scored twice in Hart's 5-1 pummeling of Partick Thistle in the League Cup final. Hart's terrible trio had begun to break up by then, Alfie Conn having gone to Wraith Rovers with Jimmy Wardhorse soon to follow him to Fife by joining Dunfermline. But Willie Bald endured and while he missed the third of Hearts League Cup wins of that era against Thurlanach in 1959-60. He claimed a historic goal in a 4-4 draw with St Mirren, which saw uh, them finish the same season with another championship title. How do you honestly think the uh, terrible trio compared to the famous five? Well, I felt that We'd, we'd a better, we always, very seldom have beat us, you know, I mean, on our day, I'm told I've got medals east of Scotland and, and they could never really, very seldom they beat us, you know, I think the difference was, I think we'd, a, the likes of myself and David Mackay, wing halves were the main, that was your, you know, what they call the, the, the strength of your team, feeding these lads, you know, we need a good forward line, no doubt about it. But I didn't think they get fed the same way as our boys get fed because Davy and I were always getting a grip of their inside forwards and they to worry about us, you know. So, you know, I think they get more service. I mean, and Hibs were brilliant, they were brilliant, but I felt they didn't get enough service. Of course, this is what the game was about in these days, you know, feeding wingers and, and space. And, and at the end of the day, I, I felt that was the difference between the two teams. I think we had a better balanced team, you know, from the midfield. And uh, when we went to win the cup, now Bobby Dugan, who played with Hearts, he was a brilliant footballer, but he didn't suit, suit our, you know, Bobby for Glasgow. He didn't suit our, our, uh, let's say he was holding on to the ball too much, you know, and the ball wasn't coming fast enough to that front man, you know. I mean, this is that again. But uh, I feel that was the difference with the, with the Hibs, you know. I mean, they'd wing half right enough, but. Davey and I like to attack. If Davey went, I sort of made a this lay back, just like, you know, you, you sort of pivot. So you balance your, your set up. And I feel that was the difference. They, we used to feed the, the forwards, we used to kid them on, you know, just that uh, get the ball up quick. If Jimmy Ward would come back, he'd come back just too far back, and I used to hunt him, you know, up my road. Because that's, I said to him, say, si, if he's 20 yards away from me, so I'll feed you, you know, and this is, this is, you, you talk to one another as if you're, and that was the difference, I think, with a great blend. Remember, I would think the best heart team I've ever seen would be Brown and Go, Bobby Parker at right back, Big Tom McKenzie at left back, Dave Mackay at right half, Freddie Glidden centre half, and John Cummins at Len, left half, Tommy Sloan outside right, Alfie Conn inside right, Molly Bald at centre, Jimmy Wartor inside left, and John uh, Johnny Erkert at outside left. These reminiscences form a colourful outline of Willie Ball's career, the more minute detail of which included such feats as a hat-trick in the first representative match he played against the Irish League in 1950. A subsequent appearance for the Scottish League, 
this time against the League of Ireland in 1958, ended with his claiming five goals. Such was the King's celebrity in Edinburgh in those days that the conductor on the tram car which trundled along towards Tynecastle would ding his bell and shout, Woolly Bald Stop! Youthful footballers on their way to play at Megatland on a Saturday morning would stare reverentially at a certain terrace building in the area and whisper, that's Willie Bald's house. Scottish football, arguably, has not produced a better loved player than the man whose name evokes to this day the most respectful discussion, even amongst those who never saw him in action. His appeal went much deeper than his deeds on the field. <coughs> the man had style as well as skill. He had charisma, if you like, although such a tribute probably would have embarrassed him because he was also a man of modesty. Well, just because he, he was such a, a brilliant player and uh, a nice lad too, with it. I mean, he, he never saw the limelight, Willie Ball. He seemed to be of a quite a quiet disposition. And uh, many other players uh, saw the limelight at that time, but never Willie Ball. You never heard them having uh, had a this and had a that, you know. Never. He always kept very, very quiet. And uh, I think uh, that's how the people respected Willie Ball. Just uh, because maybe of his nature. They might have even been a bit of Tommy Walker rubbed off in them. You know, and uh, that's no bad thing. But uh, they just seem to take to the hearts of the people. And uh, going back to even these old Edinburgh city days, uh, who are now defunct, uh, it was it was adored by even the Edinburgh city, and it followed on to Tyne Castle. And uh, it was just brilliant. He was a brilliant player. Well, I. I, I See, the youngies don't know much about them, you know, you go to these supporters thing and see the older people, you know, I mean, they're still, you know, going to the games, and but the young fellas don't, you know, I'm talking about, they don't know much about them, you know, but it's uh, going back the years when they played, it's uh, with a lot of heart supporters all over, you know, I'm talking about Craig Miller and Dal Keith and all places, and he used to turn up with 53,000 at Tyne Castle in the days, you know. And it's older people, me, the young fellas will ask me about volleyball, and you know, and it's hard to, you know, for them never to be able to see him. You know, this is the thing. I think if they'd seen him, you know, in a, in a video or something, you know, I'm talking about if he'd been alive today, and everything about him, you know, is that good in the air, and he's, if somebody ruffled him, that was the main thing. Whenever he somebody ruffled Wally, he got his dander up, you know, and he could, he could sort, he could sort them out. Do you think he compares to any modern day players? Uh, he's above any modern day players. I think he, you know, he that much strength in volleyball. You know, his strong body and he could lay off ball with the head and he could, you know, everything about him was really, he had a great touch. I mean, you you were playing with centre hearts at Wally Woodburn, big fellas in the days. Well, Wally was only about five feet, seven and a half or five, eight. He maybe wasn't to be that. But yet in there he could. You could, they could handle them, you know, I'm talking about centre half, well, it was Willie Telford, it wanted to, you know, they just had a natural, and the more you dug them, the more, the better player he was, you know. But, uh, what do you think Willie's own happiest memory of his spell at Tyne Castle would have been? Well, I think Willie, when he went on tour, Willie Bald was, you know, he was very relaxed and, and Ken, the, everything was all gelling together when we were playing, gone in South Africa, Australia, and all these places. And it was, there were people coming to visit him from, that had been from Edinburgh and went out to Australia and places like that. And oh, you thought it was your back in Edinburgh. You know, just, it was, you know, I mean, that's it's a, a thing that he'll always be remembered, you know. Uh, Gordon Smith, when he moved from Hibs to help Hearts win their second championship, used to remark upon Willie Bald rushing to check the team list of a Friday to see if he was playing the next day. He never took his place for granted. Alfie Conn described him as being the brains of the terrible trio. And another contemporary, Alec Young, described him as completely two-footed and added that while he may not have been a great dribbler of the ball, 
He had superb vision and was, of course, outstanding in the air. Opponents were no less fulsome in their praise. An old adversary and contemporary of Florrie Riley's at Hibbs, Hedy Turnbull, saying, in my book, Willie was supreme, a super player. Unlike our own Laurie Riley, who was sharp as a tack and never stopped moving, Willie was more the playmaking type who led his line well. Turnbull testified also to Willie Ball's superb ability in the air, and the old Airdrie player, Dougie Bailey, commented, Ball was the first player I can remember. Dennis Law was the second, who could jump and stay there until the ball came across. His timing was so good, unbelievable, really. But one of the most touching and telling tributes to Willie Ball came after he retired, in the form of a letter of appreciation to the Daily Record newspaper, from a former Rangers centre-half, Willie Moles. He recalled a match against Hearts in which Rangers had pushed into a two-goal lead and added, Hearts were out of it until a long ball was played through the middle to Willie. I started to go for it, then hesitated when Willie ran in the opposite direction. By the time I got going again, the ball had passed me. Jimmy Ward, who had bounced up from nowhere and scored. Hearts were into top gear then and won 3-2. Hearts were into top gear by then and won 3-2. The salient point Willie Moles uh, saved for later, saying that the critics blamed my inexperience for the loss of that goal, but I prefer to think it was down to the genius of Willie Bald. I think his, his biggest strength was in the air, you know, but he was strong, you know, he was, he was, he was built like a gorilla, you know, I'm talking, you know, really powerful. And he could hold this all in the air like I've never seen any player do. You know, he was up there and he, his timing, everything was... There. I don't think there were a better header in Scotland. I mean, I've seen English, but in Scotland, I think he was outstanding. And he was quite strong, you know, even at running short short distances and that. He wasn't what they call, a, you know, a long-distance runner. You know, he was more or less, which all you needed in these days, five yards away from somebody, you know, about... Various newspaper critics of the time used the same superlative to describe the fated Tynecastle centre forward. Among them, Jack Hartness, who, after a glittering career with Hearts, wrote for the Sunday Post. Reporting in Edinburgh Derby in 1955, which Hearts won by 5-1, Jack Hartness testified, Hibs were on the end of ten top-notchers and a genius. That genius, of course, was Willie Bald, who scored twice in the match to give his side their biggest win over their Edinburgh rivals since the Second World War. Other critics, like Tommy Gallagher, the former Dundee player who went on to write for the Courier newspaper in that city, described Willie merely as being brilliant. Hearts fans were lyrical about him, singing, there's a team in Bonnie, Scotland, their colours are maroon, they have the finest centre that Scotland's ever known. You can talk about your Rileys, your Buckleys and them all, but you ought to hear the roar go up when Willie's on the ball. Willie Bald was on the ball until the spring of 1962, when at the age of 34, and in spite of hints that he might be offered a coaching job at Tynecastle, the newspapers carried the stark announcement that he'd been given a free transfer. He accepted his lot, philosophically enough, saying, I suppose I'm a bit disappointed about being released by Hearts. Mind you, I have to admit that I'd expected a free transfer for about three seasons.
Okay. They spurned a few offers to continue his career elsewhere, and a testimonial match against Sheffield United was arranged in his name for the November of that year. It duly attracted a crowd of 15,000, the kickoff having to be delayed for a couple of minutes whilst the king, wearing a soft hat for a crown, took his bow in the centre circle. The proceeds amounted to around 3,000 pounds, which was a considerable sum in those days, enough to buy a house, maybe. Sheffield United's expenses had to be deducted, likewise the police and catering expenses. And infamously, Willie even was charged for the cost of the match ball. Thus, he was left with around 1,700 pounds, and a grievance which was to linger for the rest of his life, and likely to prevent him from ever returning to Tynecastle. Well, the testimonial game, you know, I mean, when I say that, I mean, that, that, it, it, it went the wrong way about it when I was telling you, you know, I mean, Ken Howie, the ball, he, he didn't ask the trainer anything for the ball. You know, I'm, I'm honest, I, I don't want to, and uh, if he did ask the trainer, the trainer would give him two balls, they'd give him a jersey and see that, he'd lifted the ball and away with it, you know, and nobody knew what, what happened, but, you know, that is, it's one of these things, you know, and all you need to say to John Harvey, you know, uh, give me a ball, give me a strip, John Harvey would have given him it, but just the way things happened, the ball went amiss, and so what, what do you do, you know, but it, it's, you know, it, it, there are a certain way, but that was Willie's sort of, you know, Ken, it wasn't it was nasty, that I just felt that it was you, this without, Oh no, I mean, uh, I got on well with him and he was a, a brilliant player and, and uh, these things didn't worry me, but I felt that, you know, all right, it isn't it wrong, you know, I mean, if I'm, I'm talking to you, that it wasn't it wrong, so the end of the day, they're all saying, you know, to me, and I just tell them I don't want it, for them, but I'm honest when I'm telling you, so now. Only ball. Well, uh, not knowing so very much about it, but that time was that, I had the, the income to live in Glasgow. And I didn't have the same opportunity to follow Hearts, but uh, having played so well and for quite a long time with Hearts, I don't think Hearts gave them a very good deal at all. Because, uh, well, they gave them a testimonial, but uh, they took all the expenses of that testimonial off the bully. And instead of coming out with Maybe saying, well, say for instance, a figure of two thousand pounds. Well, he only come out with one thousand five hundred, which was a lot of money at that time, you know. And I, I don't think uh, the arts director were very good to Willie Bolden at all. I really don't think so. I thought he he didn't get a good deal. And uh, strange as it may seem, but the uh, hearts were a wee bit tight. In many instances, even even the the great Tommy Walker didn't make an awful lot of money out of Hearts, and and others. I mean, there was one the great wing half, uh, the previous wing half to John Cummings. To the great John Cummings was a, a chap by the name of David Lane, who was a fantastic wing half. Well, he left the. Uh, he left Tyne Castle because of a dispute regarding money. And it was, uh, I think it was something to do with bonuses. Oh, I felt, I think when Alec Young came on the job, you know, I think Willie had a sort of, you know, a ten of sort of, you know, Alec Young was a good player, you know. And Alec Young could play anywhere. You know, he's played outside right in their game and all, and he could play anywhere like Gordon Smith. I think Willie, he a wee bit of, you know, just, Childish, you know, I, this is this is my word, childish, you know, just sort of, he wouldn't accept that he had to fight for his place, you know, and there are players like that, and Willie's nature was that, that was his nature, sort of, he accepted it, and that was the difference, Alec Young was a, you know, he was a gifted player with, he floated about like a, like a gazelle, you know, he was a lovely mover, and I think when Alec started to go into centre forward, the sort of, this is what happened, and I knew Wally well, and that was what, you know, really, if it had been a better boy that, see, this young boy is not no get my place yet, which you get people doing, they're going to battle you. But I think Wally was quite happy, he's sat on his sidelines and more or less, 
But it's his, it's his character now. You know, I got him. He was, I think he was one of the finest centers I've played with. You know, and it's. I think he was just more or less. He gave up the ghost when somebody young came in and, you know, Alec and Alec was gifted. I think uh, today, with the management uh, we now have at Tynecastle, insofar as we've got quite a great lad now, as far as the heart supporters are concerned, with Jim Jeffries. It would be great to think that uh, they would even at this day and age try and contact John Cummins and Dave Mackay, bring them back to Tynecastle in an advisory capacity and instil what they instilled into Hearts teams in previous years and that they would be world champions again. I think so. That's my, my opinion because the spirit these uh, two lads, Dave Mackay and John Cummins, they never gave up. They never said die. And uh, but the way both of them got treated, I mean, Dave Mackay got transferred. To this day, I'll never know why. But uh, that just seemed to be the the way the Tank Castle board went at that time. And it, it's very unfortunate that one should have to say that because uh, there was a great camaraderie at the Tank Castle in these days. And bear in the mind that Tommy Walker was manager then. So, and uh, I don't think Tommy would want the players treated in that way. But the board were well, all powerful. So what they said went. And even the great Tommy Walker went left Tank Castle very quietly at the wind up. Seems to be a bit of a pattern. I mean, Willie Bald, we know about the testimonial and things. But yes. After the testimonial, Willie really had nothing else to do with the club. How, how did you feel about that? Did you feel he'd handled that correctly? Or? I think so. I think so. I mean, uh, for, for what he had done, you know, the glory that was at Tyne Castle at that time, the atmosphere that was created, bear in mind that in these days, when I went to Tyne Castle, 25, 30, 35,000 was quite common on a Saturday afternoon at Tyne Castle. So uh, the way the, the players were treated, I mean, the board couldn't, uh, couldn't have been displeased at the money that was coming through the gates every Saturday because the place was packed. And that went on for many, many years. And why they should they treat great servants like that, I just don't know. I mean, there may be reasons for it, but uh, I mean, Tommy Walker would come on the board of directors, but even after that, Tommy slipped away uh, from that, from the board. Those of us who knew him only from the terraces of Tyne Castle remember Willie Bald for being so generous with his skills. In fact, he did return some 12 years later when his nephew was mascot at a match involving Kilmarnock. Jim Cruikshank, the great Harps goalkeeper of the time, was to recall the occasion vividly, saying, We were sitting in the dressing room preparing to take the field when we heard this almighty roar from above. We couldn't understand what was happening until somebody came in and told us that Willie Bald had just appeared. I think he put thousands on the gate that day. Willie sat in the director's box next to his old captain, Bobby Parker, who, of course, was on the board by that point. Pat Stanton of Hibs testified years later that he was about to take his place in the same area of the director's box when a hand tapped him on the shoulder and a deferential voice advised him, that's Willie Bald's seat. Willie Bald died in 1977 when he was only 49. I don't know how he died, what happened? He choked. He was just, you know, he choked. That's, he was just getting dumb. Very young. Aye, uh, a young man. Jimmy Ward was the same, actually, Jimmy. Aye, uh, he was the very same. Uh -huh. It was sad, aye. Uh, but Willie was a, quite a heavy smoker, you know, and, and his tongue had, aye. Uh, but, uh, Was there a big turnout at his funeral? No, aye, uh, big, aye. Uh, well, there was a big turnout. Jimmy Ward was an all, aye. Uh, well, they were well, you know, they were, they were dedicated. Jimmy Ward, huh? 
then a journalist and sadly drawing towards the end of his own life, was asked by many of his old Tynecastle teammates to pen a tribute to the man they called the King. But he chose not to eulogise the footballer whose gifts were treasured memories by then. Instead, Jimmy remembered the man and wrote, well, he was a quiet sort of person, but always found time to talk to a youngster on the street, encourage a new signing, or chat to an old age pensioner who just wanted to say he'd spoken to Willie Bald. He was always fun to be with, for he had his own brand of pokey humour. Above all else, he was generous, as his many friends will testify. Those of us who knew him only from the terraces of Tynecastle remembered Willie Bold for being so generous with his skills. We hurried along to the ground on a Saturday to see a man who, while apparently never in a great hurry himself, contrived, nonetheless, to be ahead of the game rather than behind it, dictating so much of the action, providing so much of the excitement. Lesser players with a more artisan-like approach to the game hurried here, scurried there, dripped beads of sweat, got their shorts muddied even. They were the commoners of football. Willie Bald carried himself like a king. He was the king. first game played at Tynecastle following the untimely death of Willie in March 1977 when a minute's silence was held in his memory. The silence was total, the silence was complete. Prior to the start of the second half, as the ball boys emerged from the tunnel to take up their stations around the ground, from my seat in the stand I watched a lone figure emerge from the crowd at the Gorgi Road end, make his way down to the retaining wall and beckon to the approaching ball boy. Leaning over the wall to speak, the elderly gentleman opened his coat and handed to the boy a bunch of daffodils. Whereupon the young lad trotted up the park towards the centre circle before placing the flowers exactly on the center spot, the very spot on which the king had reigned supreme during all those wonderful years. This simple, humble, and anonymous gesture exemplified the esteem in which Bald was held by all who had known him, spoken with him, or merely seen him play. No player in the game then and since has been more revered than Willie Bald, a legend in his own lifetime, who greatly enriched the lives of countless people, and who, with his teammates, in that golden era, gave a sense of achievement and fulfilment to the lives of tens of thousands of us lesser mortals. <laughs> 